When my grandmother grew up on a farm here in Trandlag, she was one out of 11 siblings. She went every second day to school because the children had to help out on the farm and the school system was poor. When she was 12 years old, she had to leave home and make her own living, like her siblings before her. At that time, Norway was one of the poorest countries in Europe. We had stable summers, cold winters. Now, four years ago when she died, she lived in a well-functioning nursing home, in a welfare state, in one of the richest countries in the world. It happened in less than a generation. You may nod your head and say, yeah, we found oil, so it was easy. But actually, the infrastructure of the Norwegian welfare state was there the year before we found the oil. Because our politicians across political parties had come together, decided that this is what we are going to work for, and put the efforts to it. And the people were behind it, supported it, and it happened. Since then, other countries have made similar journeys. And one of the consequences is that it seems like we have connected our strive for welfare with a certain consumption pattern. Let me draw you a picture. If you go to the streets of Accra, the capital of Ghana, you will find loads and loads of clothes. Some even with the tags on. They have never been in the stores because they are dumped there by the international garment industry that doesn't want to destroy the European market or the Western market. Some of them is called dead white man's clothes. We have donated them because we want to do good and maybe because we want to feel better about ourselves. The truth is that our consumption pattern is so that it's not even enough people for all the clothes that we are uh, producing. And not only that, what we think is for help has actually destroyed the local garment industry because no seamstress or tailor can beat the price of the ready-made dress. If we continue, we can see children that should have been in school but that are working on the met getting the metals out of the iPhones or the computers that we have thrown somewhere, maybe even here in Trondheim, so that it can go back into the production process so we can keep up the pace of our consumption. We can feel the pollution, maybe from old cars with a moose as a sticker on the back, because we have exported what we no longer can use here because we are on a different development path. And I've not even mentioned the plastics, the miles and miles of plastics on the beach or the sea that is eating the beaches and eating the houses along the coast. It cannot continue this way, and we all agree on that. And the good thing is that we have decided on the sustainable development goals. That is a second phase that we are committing ourselves to sustainable development. I will claim that part of the problem that we have come where we are is the first phase and the Brundtland report, who said that we should reduce our consumption so that other countries could raise theirs. What actually happened is what I just told you, we just exported the problems. Now, 193 world leaders have committed their countries to be part of a change where we stop poverty, stop hunger, clean up the seas, give a decent education to everybody while we combat climate change and other things. And it happened to be so that the leaders of Norway and Ghana actually have their advocacy role at the global stage right now. Have you heard about that from our, our state leader? We don't speak much about that here, but in Ghana, it is actually a big fuss around it. And as I'm talking here, they're about to produce the first national budget around the Sustainable Development Goals, saying that they will make the power that is in this framework to take Ghana out of poverty and to make Ghana a hub of change in Africa. Ghana have done that before. It was the first country in the world 
that came out of colonialism, at least the first country on the African co continent, and the other countries followed. And it has had stable democracy for 20 years, and it has a stable growing economy. So it can do it. But we need to be part of their commitment if it's actually going to happen. And it will have all sorts of consequences for us if they get out of poverty, move beyond aid. So what can we all do? Because when we talk about development, we leave a lot to technology development. But it's actually about political and human will. Here in Trondheim, we can start with ourselves. NTNU, our own university, has this beautiful slogan, knowledge for a better world. What does that really mean? Well, since the 80s, we have received Ghanaians and other nations here to take their degrees. So when I move around to different departments in Accra now, I often met, are met with, how are you? Because people with higher education from outside have come back and are now in positions. So the picture I draw for you is just half the picture of the situation there, because there is a vibe for change. There is a vibe for interest and to do the same journey that we have done. But they need us on board. And the message is universal, but right now that Norway and Ghana are on this shift together. It will have to start with us. And we have the eyes of the globe on us, and we can make it happen. We can write history if we are willing to, but it takes you and me to make our leaders, our institutions, and our households accountable. Please, make it happen. Thank you.